Good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jennifer Goyette, and I am the director of Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project. And I'm Ethan Ortega, the site manager for Los Lucetos Historic Site. In 2009, Mesa Prieta began a lecture series locally, one that we've continued to run until this day. But tonight, we are really excited to announce our new partnership with Los Luceros Historic Site. We're very excited about this partnership as well. Uh, shortly after becoming a state historic site, we started discussing creating our own lecture series. But fortunately, there was this amazing lecture series already here. So it was a no brainer to team up. And tonight, we're lucky enough that Ethan is willing to host our first lecture of the year. Yeah, so we'll have many lecturers throughout the series uh, all the way into the fall, um, but I'm lucky enough to get to kick this new series off. And I'll be sharing with you all some of our recent research into the archives of Los Lucetos Historic Site. You can stay in touch with us by following our newsletters or following us on social media. You'll get announcements about all of our upcoming lectures and events and news. And thank you so much for joining us for this kickoff event. And uh, please bear with us as this is our first virtual lecture, but it should begin shortly. Thank you. All right, so I understand the microphone wasn't working. Um, let's try that. Okay, so I think we've got the microphones figured out. All right, so hello everyone. Uh, to reiterate, my name is Ethan Ortega and I am the site manager for Los Lucetos Historic Site. Thank you for joining us and thank you for uh, being patient while we figure out this first virtual lecture. And um, it looks like it's working, so we're good to go. Um, so tonight we're going to be exploring the history of Los Lucetos Historic Site. Uh, and I began as the manager last fall, um, and we've heard lots of interesting stories about the site's history. We've heard about um, the site being the first courthouse for Rio Arriba County, um, as well as there being hangings that happened here um, and people sentenced to death. Um, we've even heard stories about Oñate, the, the uh, person who led the 1598 uh, European settlement colonial expedition here um, to have buried his treasure. Uh, so, you know, there's lots of interesting stories. And as we go through tonight, we're going to talk about some of these that might be true and some of them that might not be. Um, and so... Let's go ahead and see if we can bring up the presentation. All right.
And so, you know, this is an interesting way to give a talk because usually I can ask people questions and make it pretty interactive. Um, but right now I'm talking to nobody. At the end of this talk, I will check out Facebook for questions um, and try to answer some of the questions people might have. I saw the first question was, why are you uh, presenting this if it happened uh, in uh, March uh, 28th of 2019? And so um, that was when the site was designated as a state historic site. Um, and so uh, we're, we're a little ways away from that, but uh, we're taking this opportunity to share the history of the property. And so some of you might not know, where is Los Losados historic site? Los Losados is located in northern New Mexico. We're about 45 miles north of Santa Fe, and we sit along the Rio Grande River. So we have about a, a half a mile of riverfront property here. Um, and then who owns Los Losados Historic Site? So currently, Los Losados Historic Site is owned by the state of New Mexico. Um, and then it's uh, managed by the Department of Cultural Affairs. We're actually the largest state entity for cultural uh, programs and resources in the country. Um, and then the site is specifically managed by New Mexico Historic Sites, which manage about eight properties throughout the state. And so the history of Los Losados often becomes, it often starts at uh, the, the Spanish Entrada and the Spanish settlement of the area. But people living here actually goes way, way back. And so here on this slide, um, you can see some of the oldest artifacts that have been found in the area here. And so um, these things are from what's called the Archaic Period. And this is kind of a transition. People have been living in New Mexico uh, for the past about 13,000 years or so. Um, there were people here towards the end of the Ice Age actually hunting really big animals like mammoths and things. And as the climate starts to change, uh, people start to adapt. And so here in this area, we find spear points from this time period, and then gradually they become arrowheads as the things people are hunting become smaller um, and as life changes. And so uh, during this period, people also start to practice um, cultivating crops. Uh, so things like corn, um, other kinds of plants like that. And um, as that becomes uh, really popular, uh, people start to become a little bit more sedentary. And so when people start to become more sedentary, they have time to do lots of other things. And um, this is an example from Mesa Prieta, which sits just on the other side of the river from us. Uh, and these are some petroglyphs from the Archaic period, uh, from that period that we were talking about, where people were in transition, going from moving around the landscape a lot to starting to become a little bit more sedentary. And uh, here are some of the examples from that time period. There's lots and lots of examples here on the side of the Mesa. And uh, most of these petroglyphs are carved into basalt. Uh, it's a large uh, area with volcanic rocks. And so um, as time continues, people start to adopt agriculture even more uh, and become more and more sedentary and start to establish villages. It's often uh, you know, misrepresented that the first settlements here were when the Europeans arrived or that the Spanish settled New Mexico. Uh, but that's that's not true. So beginning around 1250 AD, so almost 800 years ago, people were starting to build large villages here in this area. And so uh, the diagram that you see here is actually Fiogue Pueblo, which is located very, very close to Los Losados historic site. Um, and when Fiogue Pueblo was occupied, uh, the people that were living there had built almost 400 rooms. Uh, it was a very, very large village. And it's estimated that the population of Fiogue Pueblo could have been up to maybe 200 people at any given time. And so uh, there's lots of signs along with the, uh, the village itself. There's lots of signs of what people um, were doing and, and uh, how they were living here on the landscape. And so one of the things that we see around are potential field house sites. Uh, so they were living in this village up on a bluff above the floodplain, but a lot of agriculture was going on along the rivers and places that naturally got watered whenever the river flooded. 
Uh, and so this is an example of what a field house might have looked like, maybe a one or two room structure that might have been out where the agricultural fields are. Um, interestingly enough, the hacienda, which is one of the main structures here at Los Losados historic site, uh, some of the lower foundations of one part of the building have what's called puddled adobe or coarse adobe. And that's basically where uh, the wall is made using mud balls and they would be stacked up to a certain level and then let that dry and continue until you got to the desired height. That type of construction and architecture was really common and widespread throughout the American Southwest until the arrival of Europeans. And from that point forward, uh, molded bricks start to become uh, popular and, and more in use. And so the fact that our hacienda here has some foundations that are made out of coarse or puddled adobe suggests that the hacienda could have started maybe as a field house. And as the, the European settlers moved into the area, they might have built upon that structure. Uh, other things that we see around is pottery. There's lots of pottery here in this area. Um, and so we have no doubt that the people of Fioge were using the property to grow crops and to do other things. Um, we find lots of what's called bandolier black on white or biscuit ware. Um, this is the main painted type of pottery that was used in this area. Um, and it's black and white. And you can see there's lots of really beautiful designs on here. We do have one complete bowl that has been recovered from the property. And we have that on display in our visitor center. Uh, but we see lots of pieces of pottery elsewhere whenever we're walking around, um, you know, conducting agricultural activities, and so on. Also, a kind of living reminder of the people that used to live here are the sandhill cranes. So we all love to see the sandhill cranes migrating in the winter. Um, coming down from southern Colorado all the way down to southern New Mexico and back up. Um, and really, the reason why we have cranes in such a large number and that travel up and down the Rio Grande is heavily thanks to the people that were farming during this time period. Um, and so the Pueblo people all up and down the Rio Grande were practicing a really intensive corn agriculture. And so there's all of this extra food that's growing along the river, and the birds notice that. And so some recent archaeological studies suggest that the reason that the, there's so many uh, migratory birds that fly through this route um, is because of the crops and because of that access to food. And so the Pueblo people were performing agriculture on such an intense level that it actually increased the population of migratory birds and it changed their migratory route as well. And we can see this in the archaeological record by an increase in the, in the number of these types of animals that are represented, um, whether they're being used for food or ceremony. And so Fioge Pueblo was uh, really, really active um, from about 1250 uh, AD all the way until uh, the arrival of the Europeans. And so the first European settlers of this area came with the Oñate expedition in 1598. There had been lots of other uh, European explorers uh, previously, but uh, the Oñate expedition were the first European people that came to this area specifically to set up a colony. And so in conducting research, um, uh, we start to realize a little bit more about these people. And we often kind of, you know, give blanket terms to things. And so, you know, we call this the first European settlement of New Mexico. But really, once we start to look into who these people actually were, um, there's a lot of people that actually had, um, had uh, you know, diverse genetics and, and diverse cultural uh, and ethnic histories. Um, and so it wasn't just people that came from Europe, traveled here to settle. Um, it's people that were, um, you know, uh, had European and indigenous ancestry um, and cultural traits, and they were bringing that up with them. Um, so it was really much more complex than we than we typically make it out. Um, that being said, Oñate uh, and you know his uh, his soldiers definitely um, were not good guys. Uh, they did a lot to uh, harm the local indigenous people during this time. Um, started a lot of conflict. 
And of course they were coming and moving in and taking up resources that the people that were already living here needed to survive. Um, and so it wasn't an easy time at all. And when Onyate came, uh, he brought about 129 colonists with him, 10 Franciscan friars, and about 7,000 head of livestock. Can you imagine how much food it would take to keep 7,000 head of livestock alive? They were probably just ravaging the landscape here. And so uh, Onyate sets up their first uh, settlement at uh, San Juan de los Caballeros. Um, and then shortly after that, they create another settlement called San Gabriel. And that was at the, the confluence of the Chama and the Rio Grande rivers. Um, not too long after that, uh, Governor Pedro de Peralta, uh, he comes to the area and he decides that it's really not the best place to set up the first settlement. And so they actually move a majority of the, the colonists to what is now Santa Fe, which has remained our capital since then. But that doesn't negate the, the impact that the European settlers had uh, here in this area. And one of those things was people at villages like Fioge leaving. And so, of course, we don't have any photographs of the people of Fioge, and there's been very, very limited archaeological research done on the site. And so I'm going to share with you an oral history that was recorded here at Los Luceros Historic Site and transcribed um, about what happened to the people of Fioge whenever the Europeans uh, arrived in the area. Um, and I'll be illustrating it with historic images from Okeowinge Pueblo, which is our, our closest uh, Pueblo village that's still active and one of our stakeholders as well. And so Fioge Pueblo was active until after the arrival of Europeans. And according to their oral history, they did not like what was going on um, with the, the conflict that was brought in, the um, pressure to convert uh, and change their way of life, which I mean, who would? And so uh, the people of Fioge Pueblo actually decided to collectively move away and they set out west and all but one person left. There was one old woman that chose to stay there because she was born there and she didn't think she could make the trip. And so she wanted to stay and live the rest of her life at Fioge Pueblo, her home. Uh, and then the rest of the village continued on and they got to Jemez, uh, the Jemez region, the Jemez Pueblos, and they um, decided that that wasn't really the place for them. Um, there was a big drought going on at the time and the Jemez people uh, kind of took it as a bad sign. Um, and so the, the people of Fioge kept moving west and eventually made it to the Hopi Mesas. Um, and so when, uh, after people had left, uh, the old woman that was there at Fioge started to hear a baby cry. And so she started running around. And like I said, we know that there are 350 to 400 rooms in that village. And she was running around looking for this baby. And eventually she found him and she raised him as if he were her own. And eventually uh, he kind of sets out on a quest to go find his family. So he travels, uh, travels westward after he completes a series of tasks and uh, finally makes it out to the Hopi Mesas where he finds his sisters uh, collecting water near a spring. Um, and so from there, uh, it's believed that this, this individual actually married a Hopi woman and then moved back into the, into the Tewa land um, and, and kind of came back into New Mexico. And so it's really neat that we do have some of these oral histories and these oral traditions from Fioge Pueblo that have been going on for centuries. Um, and it's also important for us to, to remember the indigenous heritage of this area. Like I said earlier, it's so often that, um, you know, histories and tours here in northern New Mexico start with the Oñate expedition in 1598. And of course, we know that the history goes back deeper for thousands of years. So this kind of leads us to the next uh, part of time. Um, so the, the Europeans are here, and then uh, the Pueblo Revolt happens in 1698, and that's another bit of local history. Uh, Pope, who is a, a very charismatic individual from Okeowinge, actually works to unite 
all of the Pueblos together to revolt against the European settlers. And uh, since most of the Pueblos speak different languages, um, they did this through a, a method of tying knots and ropes. And uh, they distributed these knotted ropes around to all the Pueblos, and they were untying one each day. And the plan was for the last day to revolt against the Spanish and push them out of the area. Uh, but the Spanish caught word. And so they actually sent runners out a day early and were still able to catch uh, the Spanish off guard. And so um, this revolt happened and uh, it was not an easy thing. It was a blood, uh, bloody um, force uh, to, on both sides to push the Europeans out. Um, and then they were gone for about 12 years. Now, during this time, a lot more people uh, and a lot more Pueblo people were heading to the Hopi Mesas as well and heading to other more remote areas to get away. They knew that the Spanish would come back and would come back with force. And that happened. Um, and so uh, the what is called the reconquest of New Mexico, but really the forcible reclamation of New Mexico by European settlers happened in 1693 and was led by Diego de Vargas. Um, and so that kind of sets the stage for the next chapter of Los Sosotos history. Uh, the next person to kind of come on stage is uh, Sebastian Martin Serrano. And uh, he is a descendant of some of the original um, European settlers of San Gabriel. Uh, his great grandparents were uh, on the Oñate expedition. And so Sebastian Martin Serrano, um, he was a captain. Uh, he, he helped with the um, reclamation of New Mexico by the Europeans. And uh, he was awarded, he and his brothers, with one of the largest land grants in northern New Mexico. Uh, so he was given 50,000 acres in 1705. Uh, and that stretched all the way from uh, Okeowinge Pueblo to Velarde uh, in the north and then all the way east to Truchas. Uh, so this map kind of shows you the, um, the north to south area of, of his uh, land grant, and then continued all the way to the Truchas Mountains. Um, so he uh, had married a woman named Maria Duhan, and uh, they settled here in this area. It's not really known exactly where the heart of their rancho was, um, we believe that it was somewhere close to Los Soceros, if it wasn't right here where we are today. Um, and they had many kids. Uh, the land grant was in a very fertile area, so they were very successful. And um, eventually, uh, when Sebastian Martin uh, was ready to, to start developing the land, um, he actually... Uh, created the main acequia that runs through the area. And this is actually one of the largest and oldest acequias in northern New Mexico, too. And so for people that aren't familiar with acequias, these are water ditches that come off of the Rio Grande and then attach back to it. And then there's a whole network of lateral ditches that come off of this to water orchards and crops and so on. And so, for example, here at Los Soceros, uh, we have almost eight miles of lateral ditches that come off of this main ditch. And it's pretty amazing that this acequia is still running from 1705 or around that time period. Uh, now, this system of irrigation is actually brought by the Spanish from North Africa. Um, so when the, uh, when the uh, people of North Africa influenced uh, Spain, um, it's something that stuck. And then it was something that was brought by them to the New World as well. Um, and when Sebastian dug this, we say that he dug it, but really, as we dive into the records, it looks like he had um, basically indentured servants from Okeowinge dig the ditch. Um, and in exchange for them digging it, he was awarding them land. Um, that's what the documents say. But really, Sebastian was giving land back to the indigenous people of Okeowinge Pueblo that was taken from them by the Spanish government. Um, and so this this land grant, since it was one of the biggest ones, like it's the name has stuck and it's had a huge impact um, all the way until today. And so this is a newspaper clipping uh, that's from uh, the uh, I believe 1917, and um, it's talking about kind of the last time that his land grant as a big chunk was sold. 
Um, and so this will kind of intersect with some of the history that we talk about in a little bit. And you can see that Los Lucetos is, is even mentioned in here. But uh, it's, uh, um, it had a big impact on the area and on the history of northern New Mexico. And so Sebastian Martin passed away before his wife. Uh, and she was the one who got to decide who inherited this vast amount of land, as well as some material culture, as well as some objects that they had owned. And so it's really interesting during the colonial period because people don't have a lot of stuff. They may have a lot of land um, and a lot of animals, but they don't have a lot of things. And so some of the things that were left uh, whenever um, Maria Lujan passed away to their children was a pan, a spoon, a bell, and a gun. Uh, and the bell was from their chapel that was uh, at the place where they had set up their homestead. Um, and so the chapel uh, is really an interesting thing, and it kind of ties into our, our history today. And so one of the reasons that we feel so firmly that the Los Lucetos historic site was kind of the center of the Sebastian Martin land grant um, and where they might have been living is because we have a capilla, we have a little chapel that's here on the property. Um, and this chapel just happens to be the exact same dimensions as the chapel that was built by the Martin family. Now, in terms of architecture, the capilla that's here um, was rebuilt and designed uh, in the style of the mid 1800s, the territorial style. Uh, but just the fact that the dimensions and the descriptions are almost exact compared to what was built in the 1700s, as well as the direction that it faces, um, is really, really compelling that this might have at least been the site of the, um, of the church or the capilla that was built by the Martin family. And so um, that kind of ends the time of the Martin family here uh, at this, in this area, and the Martin family is still around. It's not a name that you think you hear of very often, but it actually is. So Martinez, uh, Martinez is uh, the kind of derivative of that name. And over the centuries, the, the EZ was added to the end of that. And so um, for the next, uh, the next several um, decades, uh, it was still really uh, an area full of conflict, and there was a lot of push and pull um, from the indigenous communities and the and the European descended communities. Um, and so this whole area becomes depopulated uh, between the 1748 and 1750, because there was so much conflict going on that it really wasn't a safe place for anyone to live. And so for a few years, uh, people just uh, took off and, and went to much larger communities. And after that, that kind of sets the stage for our next set of family, and the family that's that's the namesake of the property, the Lucero family. Uh, but there's a second part of that name that we don't often hear, and it's Lucero de Godoy. Um, and so Lucero uh, is, a, is a word that comes from the word luz, which is light. Uh, so often Lucero in this area is interpreted as morning star or the, the, um, the, the morning star. Um, Godoy is a name that comes uh, from Spain um, and from kind of royal Spain. And it's a name that was given to people that were uh, great supporters of the king. Um, so really a royalist. Uh, and so these names come together in, in Mexico City. Uh, and that's kind of the first documentation of the Lucero de Godoy family in the New World. Um, and they were royalists. Uh, there's several letters that we have from this family during this time period um, about them doing anything that in their power to support the king of Spain uh, and to further his mission. And so uh, the Lucero family uh, comes up into what is now New Mexico, and they weren't necessarily a wealthy family to begin with. Um, what they started doing was they started marrying smart. And so the Lucero family started marrying in to lots of bigger um, families with land grants and with money and livestock. And so um, that's how they become part of this area. Uh, they married into the, um, the Martin family. And that brings the Lucero name uh, in, the, in the 1700s here to, to this area. 
and that name starts to stick. Um, and so uh, Los Luceros, and uh, this is their this is their family crest. Um, what's really interesting at Mesa Prieta, there's actually a few uh, petroglyphs that are from this time period that are of lions and are believed to be made from Europeans. And so uh, I would not be surprised at all if it were some of the Lucero descendants that were um, adding their part of the story into the sides of the Mesa as well. Um, and so when we start to speak about Los Luceros during this time period, um, and Plaza de los Luceros. It wasn't like a plaza or a community that we think of um, today. So, you know, when you think of a plaza, you might think of the plaza in Santa Fe or um, downtown or in Old Town Albuquerque. Um, this community really stretched along the Rio Grande. Um, so it went from Alcalde all the way for 10, 15 miles, all the way up to Velarde. And um, that was the Plaza de los Luceros. And so it consisted of lots of family members, lots of buildings, um, but the thing that they all shared in common was that they were practicing agriculture here along the Rio Grande. Um, and so the Lucero family uh, is here for quite a long time and, and uh, like I said, long enough for that name to stick and um, it stayed here. And they actually uh, continued living on what is now the historic site until the early 1900s. But during that time, the, the land started to be separated and other families started to come in um, and it started to become segmented. And so kind of the next set of uh, interesting characters here um, that were able to tie specifically to the property um, are Elia, Elias and Maria Clark. Um, and so, they actually, so Elias Clark, he was an immigrant from Ireland. Uh, and when he was about 25 years old, he ends up in this part of New Mexico. Um, and he married a woman named Maria uh, Lucero. And so her father uh, was Julian Lucero. Um, and he ends up starting at, towards the end of his life, he ends up deeding uh, what is now Los Lucero's historic site to Elias and Maria. Um, and the reason that he says that he um, he deeds it to Elias uh, is because uh, of how in love they are. Um, and so, you know, in the actual documents where they where they transfer the property, um, uh, Julian says it's in consideration of the love and affection that he bears for my daughter, uh, which I think is really neat. Um, and so, Elias was a was a very interesting character. Um, he. He was um, a county clerk or a, a county probate clerk. Uh, and so one of his roles was actually to transport the territorial votes of New Mexico that were cast in Rio Arriba County to Santa Fe to be counted. Um, and so not once, but multiple times, uh, he was either captured or confronted or the votes were stolen while he was transporting them from this area down to Santa Fe. And so we have several um, court documents uh, that have him in court, uh, you know, accusing people of stealing the votes. And so, you know, who knows what was really going on there. But the one thing we do know is that for at least, you know, two or three elections, um, the people of Rio Arriba's votes weren't counted and were stolen or misplaced or hidden. <laughs> um, and so uh, over the course of this time, uh, they're also um, running a store and there's lots of other ways that they're drawing money in. Um, as Julian becomes older, he keeps deeding more and more land to this couple. Uh, and so he deeds an orchard that he says is south of the main house. Um, and this is one of the, the historic orchards that we have photographs of uh, from the um, the early 1900s, it was still in existence uh, through that time. Um, Elias also was a, was a, a person that that was interested in trying new things, and so we have uh, several documents, including a report from the governor and an article in a local newspaper um, that say he was the first person to bring the crop alfalfa to the southwest, and that he had it transported all the way from Europe and brought here. Um, the seeds, and then uh, they they grew it here. 
uh, which is super fascinating. And if you walk around the property now, um, we still have fields and fields of alfalfa. It's a prolific crop throughout uh, the Southwest. Um, and it's neat to think that this property uh, may have been the first place that kind of brought that in, which changed, you know, raising animals here uh, forever. Um, and so uh, he also hosted a lot of people. Um, since he was involved with the court system, uh, he, he would host um, different kinds of government groups that were coming through to do different types of uh, surveys or people that were traveling between Santa Fe and Taos. Um, and uh, we have a lot of accounts of people actually staying the night um, here. And uh, they would sleep in the Grand Sala. Uh, they noted that uh, Maria Clark would actually eat dinner with them. And so during this time period in New Mexico, uh, when you had guests, it was really uncommon for the woman of the house to sit and have dinner with the guests. Um, but she did that which I thought was really interesting. And then after dinner, they would have some kind of entertainment in the Grand Sala, and then they would roll out mattresses on the ground for people to sleep on. And so that was a pretty traditional experience during territorial New Mexico. Um, we also believe that this is likely the time period when the Hacienda, which you can see here in the photograph, had its second story added on and some major renovations were going on. Um, before, the hacienda probably started out as a single-story structure uh, with rooms in a big square and an open courtyard in the middle. Um, and this was pretty typical of the colonial period and the reconquest period. But uh, during the territorial period, um, you know, things were a little safer. Things were, um, there was a little bit more stuff starting to come in in terms of building materials. Um, and so, the floor plan is laid out and becomes symmetrical, and then a uh, wraparound porch is created, which almost makes it look like a plantation. But when you look at the details, they're, they're, you know, the building is still made out of adobe, um, and then the details around the windows um, are uh, Romanesque. They're from the, the territorial period. Um, and so it starts to kind of change the look and the feel of the area. And uh, then, uh, uh, Elias and Maria, they have one child. They have one daughter named Elisa Clark. And um, Elisa, she marries a man named Luis Ortiz. And uh, they're the next ones to inherit this area and inherit the property. Um, and so they're the first set of people that we have really firm documentation to um, that lived in the hacienda as, it, as we see it today in this two-story structure. Um, back then, there was no stairway in the middle. Uh, you had to go up the stairs on the outside and then go into any room that you wanted to. Um, these two were really interesting characters as well. Um, and so Luis Ortiz, uh, he actually became a, a member of the House of Representatives for the Territory of New Mexico. And he participated in the 25th Territorial uh, Legislature. Um, and he served on three different committees. Um, I'm not sure how many committees they had at the time, but uh, these seemed pretty important. He served on roads and ditches, agriculture and manufacture, and railroads. Um, and then, uh, you know, he also uh, served a single two-year term as the Rio Arriba County Sheriff. And uh, by this point, uh, the county um, seat has moved from the Los Soceros area to Tierra Amarilla where it is today. Um, but prior to that, really since colonial times, uh, the, the county seat of, of Rio Arriba, which used to be everything north of La Bajada uh, on I-25, um, it, uh, it was the county seat. And, um, and so, you know, there was never really a big courthouse. And so that's one of the things that, that we had always heard was, you know, um, this was the, the county seat and the hacienda was the courthouse. And so it actually turns out there was no official courthouse until the courthouse was built in Tierra Amarilla. Um, before that, the court would rent rooms out of people's houses to try people. Uh, and we actually have a lot of those records that are still around. And the majority of people whose homes were being rented for court were the Lucero family and the Ortiz family. Um, and so that was going on here in this area. And so while it was not a formal courthouse, 
um, it's very possible that several of the, the structures here on the property were used as courtrooms or trial rooms uh, during this time period. Um, it's also said that either Elias Clark or uh, Luis Ortiz were uh, judges and, um, and that the storehouse here next to the hacienda was a jail uh, and people were hung outside of it. Um, and so to kind of start debunking those, um, they both worked with the courts and were clerks or probate um, but there's no record of any of the people that lived here at Los Losetos ever being a judge. Um, and then, uh, you know, in terms of the building being used as a jail, uh, you know, it was kind of the Wild West. <laughs> so, you know, I'm sure that there were people at times held against their will, uh, but there was never any official jail building until the courthouse was built in Tierra Amarilla. Um, and so, uh, that's another kind of thing that we hear all the time. And there's a, a concrete room inside of the storehouse next to the hacienda, which often gets interpreted as the jail cell. Uh, but we now know that the concrete was added uh, in the 1900s, so long after this time. Um, and then some, some research that our uh, state historian had conducted um, shows that uh, death by hangings and, and really like capital punishment during the, the territorial uh, an early American period in New Mexico was actually very, very uncommon. Uh, the most common punishment for any type of crime was people working in exchange for whatever amount that they might owe. Um, and so, you know, kind of debunking three things there in a row, um, we were we were probably used as courtrooms multiple times, uh, but we weren't an official courthouse. Um, we uh, didn't have a jail. Um, if people were held against their will, it wasn't documented here. Um, and probably no one was put to death by hanging. There were only two accounts um, in the whole territorial history of Rio Arriba County where people were put to death by hanging. And both of those accounts happened in Alcalde, so a community that's a, a few miles south of us. So uh, just kind of knocking off some of those, uh, those false um, false stories that have stuck to the to the site here. So um, some other interesting things about uh, Luis uh, and Eliza is they, they were involved in a lot of different types of businesses. And um, this just real quick is one of the notes that we know about that was actually from uh, Luis Ortiz as sheriff. Uh, so this is one of his letterheads, which I think is super cool and was very likely written out of the Hacienda here. Um, the other paper that I have here to show you uh, is one um, that comes directly from here at Los Losetos, and we can zoom in there on the on the header of his of his stationery, and it says Luis M. Ortiz, dealer in all kinds of fruits and vegetables, orchards and gardens at Los Losetos. Isn't that neat? Um, so, you know, this is a, a real direct connection to the site and to kind of what the site is all about. It's a fertile, fertile area. Um, and so, you know, agriculture is really the reason why people have been here for the last 800 years. Um, and also, I just really love the, the header on his stationery. It's, it's very, um, it's very uh, interesting and very, very beautiful. So this kind of takes us to, um, to the next part of the site's history. And uh, around 1912, uh, Luis starts to try and sell portions of his property off. They had you know, um, inherited and purchased a lot of buildings and a lot of acreage, and it was a lot for them to do. Um, and so uh, they tried to sell it a couple times, and those fell through to some really interesting uh, characters. Um, any of these sections really could uh, be its own whole lecture on these individuals and their impact on the site and their impact on New Mexico history. Um, but just kind of hitting some of the, the main points, um, the next shift was really to the site becoming part of a dude ranch. Uh, and so in um, 1912, uh, um, he, he starts trying to sell the property. Uh, and then a few years later, uh, he meets uh, Richard and, and Caroline Faffel. And they're some of the people that started the San Gabriel Dude Ranch. 
uh, which is just a few miles south of Los Lucetos historic site, or was a few miles south. Um, and so this dude ranch was set up by these individuals, and basically it catered to wealthy people from the East Coast coming out and pretending to be cowboys for a little while, um, while the real ranch was actually managed by people that um, knew how to conduct ranch work, uh, knew how to, to ride a horse, um, and then they would take people on expeditions all around the Southwest. Um, whenever Mary Wheelwright was living at Los Lucetos, she would use staff from the San Gabriel Dude Ranch, um, and she actually went on an expedition from Los Lucetos all the way the Grand Canyon and back. Uh, and uh, from their reminiscence of the um, of that trip, uh, they said that there were not there wasn't a single fence that they had to cross or road from here to there, uh, which is pretty incredible to think about. So now we have San Gabriel Dude Ranch here catering to um, wealthy people from the East Coast and bringing them in for um, for what they think of as a as an authentic New Mexico experience. Uh, this is something that's really being marketed at the time uh, by uh, the the railroad industry, um, you know, as to get out and find your true self in the American Southwest. Um, you know, go back to a simpler time. Uh, this kind of thing. But, you know, as we start to research this, a lot of the experiences um, that these people had were very fabricated and very planned. Um, and uh, this is one of the ads from the San Gabriel uh, Ranch uh, trying to get people to, to come out. Um, and so this is one of the things that first lures Mary Cabot Wheelwright out to the property. Um, but before that, like I said, uh, the Lucero family was still here. And even though the property had become segmented, uh, there were still families that were living here. And by the time the, uh, the San Gabriel Dude Ranch was going, um, Ursula and Abel Lucero were uh, building a brand new house uh, here at Los Luceros. Um, and so this is a photograph of their house. It's still here today. We call it the Victorian Cottage uh, because it was probably built around the turn of the century. Um, and it was made uh, from a catalog. Uh, so they ordered the plans out of a catalog, but then built it with local materials. So it's an adobe building. Um, the wood was all made locally uh, with New Mexico embellishments, um, but it was probably bought out of a catalog similar to like Sears and Roebuck. And so um, this family was really the last Lucero family to live here on the property. Of course, the Lucero family is still around us and thriving today. And when we're open, we do get lots of Lucero descendants that come and share stories and pictures. Uh, and we're hoping that once we're open again to start um, an oral history project back up in which we were collecting lots of memories of this place. Uh, but here we have Abel and, and Ursula and they, um, you know, it was the, the 1920s were coming around and um, agriculture in northern New Mexico was really not doing well. Um, basically, if you had money, you could do experimental agriculture um, and become successful. Uh, but, you know, if you couldn't, you know, afford the newest inventions or the newest seeds, everyone was struggling at this time. And so uh, the, these these Lucetos move up to Colorado and are in search of work in Colorado, and then eventually um, move elsewhere to Colorado to California and so on. Um, but this is the family that uh, that's still here. Whenever Mary Wheelwright uh, starts to purchase up the the area around their home, and so Mary was a visitor of the San Gabriel Dude Ranch, and she was brought to what is now Los Lucetos Historic Site by uh, Carol, uh, Carol Faffel, and um, she was here on horseback. And this area, you know, was actually being used by the San Gabriel Dude Ranch to pasture the horses uh, for the ranch. And they really didn't pay any attention to the buildings during this time period. And so a lot of the buildings, including the hacienda, fell into disrepair. Um, and when Mary Wilwright came through, she just had to have it. <laughs> she fell in love with the property, and as a woman who owned an island in Maine, a mansion in Boston, and a home in Majorca, uh, you know, she could pretty much get what she wanted. Um, and so she purchased uh, a small acreage of the property 
including the hacienda, and then took off. And this began um, basically a decade of renovations that were under or overseen by by um, Caroline Stanley Faffel. Uh, and so she started making the hacienda livable again uh, for people to be in there. And so we have some interesting photographs, and I didn't put one in the slide, but um, when Mary, like shortly after Mary Wilwright bought the property, uh, one of the entire walls of the hacienda collapsed. And we have this photograph with a, with a donkey standing on top of it, and the donkey could basically walk up the pile of the wall into the second story. Um, so it took a lot of work to restore. And uh, one of the things that happened during this time period was they removed all of the territorial designs from the house, and they rebuilt it or re based it in um, what is called Pueblo Revival style. Uh, and at the same time period, you know, the, it was happening at the Palace of the Governors, um, as well as other buildings throughout the state. It was kind of this idealized version of what New Mexico should look like, um, according to these individuals. And so um, there's lots of territorial things that are hidden within the house still, including the house's layout, uh, but the, um, the facade of it looks more like Pueblo Revival now. Um, and then um, some other things were brought in, like electricity, um, indoor restrooms. Before that, it was all outhouses, um, as well as um, a kitchen was brought inside of the house. Um, and so uh, this kind of shows you what Los Ceros, uh, the hacienda, looks like today. Um, we have the house decorated in a way that uh, you would have seen it during the time that Mary Wheelwright would have been living there. In fact, in this photograph, the painting that you see on the wall is a painting of Mary Wheelwright as a child. Um, but the reason that we have it decorated in that style is because that's what the architecture of the home looks like. Now, as we move forward, uh, we're hoping to bring in other influences into different rooms in the house, including we have one room that we'd like to set up to be a traditional Hispanic room that might have looked like um, what, you know, the, the Lucero family was living in or the Martin family, um, so that it's not just only representing the Mary Wheelwright period. But as you can see, it's gorgeous. Um, and so during this time period, we also start to have um, a, a Diné influence here at the property. Uh, so um, we know of the Pueblo occupation here and the people that established Fioge Pueblo um, and that continued to live here and work here um, throughout the various owners of the, the property. But uh, during the early 1900s, when Mary Wheelwright is exploring this area, um, she goes to a uh, powwow in Arizona, and she meets an individual named Hustine Claw. Uh, and Hustine uh, was a, a Diné leader, a Navajo leader, um, and uh, a medicine person who uh, was kind of doing a revolutionary thing at the time. They were taking sand paintings, which were um, temporary things that would be done for a ceremony and then erased at the end of the ceremony, and they were taking those and uh, making them permanent in weavings. And one of the reasons that Hustine was an individual that had the ability to do this is we now know that Hustine was an intersex individual or a trans individual. Um, and so they had knowledge of both the male and female realms of Diné culture and were able to, to move things back and forth in between those. Um, it also meant that Hustine had a very well-rounded view of, um, of Navajo culture. And so Hustine actually approached Mary Wheelwright, who is recorded to not be the friendliest of people to talk to, um, but Hustine had the worry that, um, that they hadn't passed on enough knowledge and that, uh, you know, with the Indian schools happening and um, indigenous students being taken away from their communities and and uh, acculturated into American culture, um, that this knowledge was going to disappear and go away. And so Hustine started working for about a decade with Mary Wheelwright. And Hustine would come to Los Luceros and in the hacienda and in the garden surrounding the hacienda, they would record on wax cylinders um, stories and chants and songs uh, and just memories of what it was like to live in, in the Navajo world. Um, and this took many, many forms. They made a 
Um, they made several books uh, and, and anthropological papers out of this. Um, and then Mary created a museum um, with the assistance of, of lots of other people. Uh, and so they um, started what was first known as the, um, the, the House of Navajo Religion, um, but then uh, has eventually become known as the, the Wheelwright Museum of the American Indian. And so this whole building has a really interesting story as well. And so this is located in Santa Fe on Museum Hill, uh, very close to the uh, Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, the Laboratory of Anthropology, and the Museum of International Folk Art. Um, and at the time, uh, she was really one of the only people in Santa Fe that was pushing for a Navajo or Diné representation uh, in the museum and cultural realm there. Um, and so she worked with, with Hustine and several other individuals to design a museum that was based off of a traditional Hogan. And when she offered to, to donate this to Museum Hill, um, the board of directors refused it. And so, you know, their, their official reasoning for refusing the donation of this museum and cultural materials was that the architecture of it didn't fit in with the Pueblo revival style um, of the buildings that were in the area. Um, and, uh, you know, Mary did not take that very easily. And, you know, kind of looking back on those, on those documents, it looks like um, there was also this, this idea that you know, maybe the Navajo culture didn't have a place there. Um, and so she helped them fight for that spot. And uh, they eventually get some land donated just on the edge of Museum Hill and get this, this building constructed. And um, unfortunately, uh, it, it opened shortly after Hustine passed away. But Hustine did uh, bless the land for this museum whenever they began construction. And um, this museum has always been a, a very progressive museum as well um, in terms of, of uh, culture and, and um, cultural preservation. And they actually returned and repatriated all of the information and all of the materials that were collected uh, by Hustine and, and Mary um, back, to, uh, back to the Navajo Nation. Um, so that's not something that they uh, any longer have. They've returned that. Um, the fear of that being lost is is gone. Um, and so it's all been given back now. Uh, and during the same time period, uh, when Mary is bringing in these really interesting characters into Los Luceros' historic site, uh, she also uh, meets this woman named Maria Chabot. Um, and Maria is my absolute favorite character out of all of Los Luceros' historic site history. Um, and I think it's because I relate to her on some levels. But uh, she was kind of a wandering soul, and uh, she was born in, in uh, San Antonio, Texas. And um, after she graduated, she just took her graduation money, basically, and went to Mexico on a trip. And on that trip, she met a woman um, that, uh, named Dorothy Stewart that was an artist and uh, lived partially in Santa Fe. And she traveled the world with Dorothy Stewart. Um, they were actually in a very serious relationship together for a while, and uh, and then they lived in Santa Fe together for a while as well. Um, and then when that relationship kind of started to to end, uh, Maria was was wandering again, and she was looking around for what her next thing was. Um, and she got a job with the um, the Works Progress Administration during the Depression uh, to photograph Spanish colonial furniture in northern New Mexico. Uh, in um, in the area, we had a school that was that was creating a revival of this furniture and teaching local people how to make this um, this Spanish colonial fur furniture as an art form, um, as a way to to generate revenue for local folk. Um, and so she was going around taking pictures, and that led her to Los Luceros and to the hacienda uh, that Mary Wheelwright owned at the time, because she had an amazing collection of Spanish colonial furniture as well as Asian furniture and Arabic furniture, um, African furniture, things that she had brought from all over the world here. And so Maria was here photographing these, these objects. And uh, she learned that she was actually a distant cousin of Mary Cabot Wheelwright. Uh, Chabot is the French version of the Cabot name. Um, and so they kind of had this little connection. 
And uh, as time goes on, um, it turns out that Mary comes back, or Maria comes back as the uh, farm manager for the site. Um, and so she was running the farm for Mary Wheelwright because Mary just wanted to come and look at birds and go on camping trips. And that was kind of it. And she would only come for a couple months of year. But this is some of the most fertile land in all of northern New Mexico. And Maria Chabot saw the potential in that. So she began farming here. Um, and some of the first crops that Maria Chabot put in here at Los Luceros when she became the farm manager um, was cauliflower. <laughs> and so we have these really interesting oral histories uh, that come from Okeawinge Pueblo of Maria driving her truck to Okeawinge to hire workers from the Pueblo for the day, and they would come out and harvest cauliflower. And it turns out that for about four years, um, Maria in Los Luceros was the main supplier of cauliflower to the entire state of Colorado and New Mexico, um, which, is, which is pretty incredible. But uh, apparently pretty soon there was a new genetic variety of cauliflower that was available that was harvestable in a much quicker time, um, which Maria didn't have access to, which kind of um, made them lo lose their, their winning edge on the, on the cauliflower industry at the time. Uh, but she went on to try lots of other experimental things, um, orchards, beans, chili, corn. She, she planted a lot of things. Um, and really enjoyed uh, the agricultural component of that. Uh, she also becomes very good friends with uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, and they actually meet um, in the dining room of the Hacienda at a lunch party with Mary Wheelwright, and Maria Chabot goes on to, um, re, uh, to, to build and, and design the home that Georgia O'Keeffe has in Abiquiu, and Maria was living here at Los Luceros while she did all of that. There's also a lot of really lovely letters that go between the two of them. And so that past photo you saw of Maria is, a, is my, one of my favorite photos of her, but it's really uncharacteristic of her. Um, this photograph of her on a tractor uh, in, in uh, you know, kind of taming the, the wilds of Los Luceros, which needs to be done every couple of weeks because uh, things grow so well here. Um, this is really more characteristic of, of the time that she spent here. Um, and after, uh, Mary Wheelwright passed away, Mary actually left um, the majority of the property to Maria Chabot. And so the guest house that's here is the house that Maria lived in um, for the several decades that she was here at the site. Um, and then after Mary had passed, she continued to live there. She wasn't a big fan of staying in the big hacienda. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, it becomes a little bit much for her uh, and so she starts, you know, trying to sell the property and trying to do something else. She's really a wanderer at heart. And so she's looking for the next thing. Um, and that's whenever the, the Colliers come in. So Nina and Charles uh, and uh, their daughter still lives here in the area, Lucy, and she still visits us regularly. In fact, she, um, she came out to the site yesterday uh, to visit her mother's grave. So Nina Collier um, was so in love with this property uh, that she um, she chose to be buried here behind the capilla. Uh, and so um, the, the Colliers had a, a huge impact here on the property um, and, and uh, helped maintain it for, for quite a while. Um, the, the property changed hands many, many, many times after the Colliers owned it. Um, and, you know, the kind of hand changing uh, increased uh, exponentially as we as we get closer to modern times. Um, but the next people that bought it that really did anything with the property uh, were Anne and Frank Cabot. So these are more cousins of Mary Wheelwright who, um, who were known for gardening um, and they had developed uh, garden clubs and developed some really prestigious gardens in historic places throughout the country. And so they purchased the property uh, in 1999 and they start, um, they start developing it. Uh, and so a lot of the crabapple trees that we have and a lot of the flowers that we have around the property are thanks to, to Anne and Frank Cabot. Um, and then they also uh, created the Los Luceros Foundation, which raised the money to really preserve the buildings as you see them today. So um, once we're open again and you're able to come visit Los Luceros, um, the, the reason that these buildings are, are still standing and in the condition that they are is thanks to, to Anne and Frank Cabot um, kind of 
trying to, you know, carry on the the legacy of their cousin and then just, you know, um, promote this beautiful, beautiful place. And so there's a few things from Frank and Anne that uh, we have to do and that was a condition of the, the state purchasing the property. Um, and some of that includes specific flowers that we have to plant around the area. And so as the site becomes more established, those are definitely things that that we're, we're working towards. And it's really nice to have an objective that's more than just keep the doors open. We also get to beautify the site and, and preserve the culture. Um, and so after the, uh, or during the, the Los Losados Foundation period, uh, and um, the, the site uh, is, starts to be considered to be purchased by the state. Uh, and it's really seen as a, as a cultural resource that needs to be protected and preserved. Uh, in the in the 1970s and 80s, the property gets listed on the National Registry of Historic Places, as well as the State Register of, um, of Cultural Places, and um, it's it's start you know they start to see really the the depth of the history that's associated with this place, uh, and so there's actually two times uh, in the last two decades that the state of New Mexico tried to purchase the property and tried to create a bill to purchase this place. Um, and it, it didn't really happen. Uh, it wasn't until uh, the Bill Richardson administration um, that the, the site was able to be purchased. And this is just over a decade ago. Uh, and so it was bought and kind of given in trust to the Department of Cultural Affairs to manage, but it wasn't designated as a state historic site or a monument or anything like that. Um, it was just being maintained as is. And so for about a decade, not much was really going on here with this property. Um, and there wasn't really funding associated with it other than like a caretaker and basic maintenance. Uh, but then um, in uh, March, on March 28th, 2019, a bill that was um, sponsored by our Richard Martinez, uh, he uh, he sponsored this bill, which added Los Luceros as the eighth state historic site or monument. Um, uh, it's it's the the monument system. The name was changed, but it's the same type of designation. Um, and so, thanks to him for sponsoring that bill, uh, it ensures that Los Luceros historic site will be preserved in perpetuity, um, and it ensures a budget here for staff to not only preserve and protect this place. Uh, but also to share it with the public. Um, and so this kind of enters our next chapter. So Michelle Lujan Grisham signed that into law and um, it enters us into this next chapter where we get to like throw the doors open and we get to invite the community in. Of course, after after the uh, the COVID restrictions have been lifted. Um, but, uh, you know, so Los Luceros today is becoming a place for our communities. Notice I didn't just say community. Uh, we acknowledge that here in Northern New Mexico, we serve many diverse communities and we wanna be a place where all of those communities can see themselves here um, and feel comfortable here. Whether that's indigenous communities, Hispanic communities, Hanesero communities, or even the LGBTQ community. And uh, we're also a place to preserve history. So moving forward, um, just in the last several months, we've already applied to multiple grants, uh, one potentially even amounting to over a million dollars in terms of preservation uh, for the structures here. Uh, we also have a big interest in conducting more archeological research. Uh, there has been small archeology span projects that have happened throughout the property, uh, but never a large overarching study, um, uh, systematic study. So that's one of our main goals that's coming up as well in the coming years. Um, and then a place to celebrate our cultures. And so uh, this photograph is from our fall harvest festival last year. And a special thanks to uh, Moving Arts Española. Um, uh, we partner every year and they provide us with some beautiful uh, entertainment. Um, and so, you know, we want a place where these kinds of cultural activities can continue to happen. Uh, we've got a commercial kitchen. We're hoping to do um, food workshops. We have fields that we hope to lease out to local farmers. And uh, we were scheduled this year to start our first farmer's market to sell um, local produce and products uh, from local, local people. 
Uh, unfortunately, that might be postponed until next year. Um, but again, we want this to be a place for everyone and to preserve our cultures and our history. Um, and so really, we are for everybody. And this is a, a photograph of the, um, the hacienda uh, from the sheep field. <laughs> and so in addition to orchards and historic buildings and crops and nature trails and river access, uh, we also have live animals here at the site. And um, as an archaeologist in the past, I have, uh, you know, kind of laughed at the sites that have live animals. Um, but after being here for the last several uh, months since last fall, um, I've kind of fallen in love with these guys. We've even bottle fed some of them. Um, and uh, and so this um, this is something that I think really adds to the historic site and that we'll probably continue doing and, and increasing the number of live animals that we have here as well. All right, so whew, I hope you guys uh, were able to handle that. <laughs> um, that was a, a really, really fast run through almost 800 years of human history here at Los Losados Historic Site. And really what I hope it was doing was to A, you know, kind of disband some of the myths that were surrounding the site, but B, um, pique your interest in this place. Um, and, you know, we're gonna be continuing to do research we have uh, Carly Stewart and uh, Rebecca Ward, who are two of our interpretive staff members that have been spending this entire shutdown doing research and preparing uh, interpretive programs to share with people for once we open up again. Um, and so I hope this just wets your whistle and that you guys will want to come out and learn more about the site when we reopen um, and follow us on, on Facebook to see you know, the other types of, of um, virtual programs that we put together. So um, now I'll go ahead and take a look and see, uh, doesn't look like we have, let's see, we'll see if we have any questions. Oh yeah, and I was reminded, and thank you to our, our cabinet secretary, um, Deborah Garcia y Griego. Uh, so she actually helped push that bill through the legislature as well. Um, and she has been a huge support for Los Lucero's historic site. Uh, in fact, a few weeks ago, some of the local people may have heard, uh, we had a fire scare where, um, where a bosque fire, a fire in the forest around the river, actually came up to our property line. And so we had assembled you know, the staff that we could uh, to remove artifacts and actually evacuate all of the animals from the property in case the fire came on. Um, fortunately, it didn't. But uh, Cabinet Secretary uh, Deborah uh, Grie uh, Garcia y Griego, she was actually here on the ground helping us load animals into trailers, helping us pack up the, the, the priceless artifacts um, to save them. And so, you know, I'm very thankful to her, Patrick Moore, um, and uh, Christine Navarro for uh, helping, helping with that uh, project. And so we have a great administration. I couldn't ask for, for any better leaders in our department. All right, so just kind of looking through for some more questions. Some comments about people falling in love with the site um, and coming to the Fall Harvest Festival. Uh, so somebody was asking if the, the portrait by, um, by Mary Wheelwright that's in the Hacienda is the original. Um, so uh, it, it is an interesting bit of art history. Uh, we actually have two replicas here at the site. Uh, the original is actually housed in a collections facility in, um, in the East Coast somewhere. Uh, I'll, I'll look that up and double check it after the presentation and I'll respond to your comment with uh, which, uh, which uh, institution houses that. Uh, so someone was asking if I could speak more about the, the Pueblo period. Um, and so uh, we actually did talk quite a bit about um, the archaic and, and Fioge Pueblo period. Of course, Los Lucetos sits on traditional Tewa lands, and that's a part of the story that hadn't been told much in the past here. And uh, we're hoping to make that a much bigger part of our story moving forward. 
Um, and so when we reopen, we have uh, several plans to, um, to have more uh, programs that, that focus on that very, very important and, and kind of founding aspect of our, of our site's history. Um, okay, so uh, another question, is there a Friends of Los Luceros? Uh, so actually, yes, we do have a friends group. It's called the Amigos del Rancho Los Luceros. Um, and I can add in the description of this after the presentation a link to their website. Uh, they just started accepting membership before uh, the COVID closure, um, but it is an organization that will be continuing. So if you want to support, you can do that. Um, you can also support Los Luceros by going to the Museum of New Mexico Foundation website, um, and there's a way that you can become a member of them. They also support us, and you can donate specifically to us through their website as well. All right. Lots of comments about the sound at the beginning, but I'm glad we got that figured out. Okay, so it kind of looks like that's the, um, the majority of questions. Uh, I'll be around and be checking the comments in the bottom. Uh, so if people have questions over the next couple of days, uh, we'll try to get that. Uh, but thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to Mesa Prieta, um, another one of our local community organizations that we're, um, we're trying to work with. And so um, actually to, to continue answering the question about talking more about the Pueblo history of the site and of the area, uh, we will be having um, another lecture coming up uh, soon, and I don't see my notes for it, but we have another lecture that will be coming up very soon, um, and it will be specifically on the history of Fioge Pueblo and the oral histories tied to that, uh, and that's going to be, it's actually by Art Cruz, um, and that's, and he's a member of Oke Wenge Pueblo. So an indigenous perspective on the, uh, the Pueblo history of the area, which we're all really looking forward to. So uh, thank you again. Uh, I really appreciate all of you watching. And uh, when we reopen, keep an eye on our website. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be posting you know, information as it becomes available. Uh, but we'd love to, to see you at Los Luceros Historic Site and keep following us here on, uh, on Facebook and on nmhistoricsites.org. Uh, to see all of the neat virtual programming that we're doing during the COVID closure. Great, thank you and have a good night.